And there was a lot riding on this speech that came amid his bid for re-election. Recent polling shows the president trailing former President Donald Trump in an expected rematch. So, Theron, did the president's performance inspire uh, as it was supposed to do Thursday? Man, I'm, I'm, my voice is kind of a little shaky because I was yelling at the television saying, go, Joe, go, Joe. I mean, this is the fiery <laughs> Uncle Joe, President Biden, that we've been waiting on. And we always knew that the president could do exactly what he did. Um, this was a man who went there and walked down the aisle. You saw Republicans and Democrats coming to greet him and make sure that when he got up there, he instantaneously went to the meat of the issues, talked about uh, the border, talked about education, talked about health care, talked about what he's been doing since the post-pandemic uh, economy that he's built. And the other thing that I really like, and I, and I wrote down a few quotes uh, that he did, uh, Deidre, but the one that really stood out to me the most, it says, he said, uh, here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only if you win. And uh, to me, that spoke so many volumes because there are some people, particularly former President Donald Trump, who now all of a sudden is coming back with vengeance to talk about things that he wants to do to try to not unite the country. And then lastly, I like that the president did not back down to Republicans. Even when he was cut off, interrupted, decorum, even though the Speaker Mike Johnson said, hey, Republicans and Democrats bring some decorum to the, uh, to the chamber, particularly Marjorie Taylor Greene disrespected that, and he kept going on. He did not allowed them to distract him for his message to the American people. And now I'm happy that he's coming to Georgia, going to other battleground states off this very good State of the Union performance. Yeah, now, Phil, the uh, president never named the former president uh, during his address, but he uh, attacked him on several fronts. Well, that was to be expected. Uh, normally, you would want to have some angry rant like he did for 70 percent of the time for a campaign speech. This was a State of the Union speech, and he referred to the, his predecessor. Um, I think there could have been some more unifying themes. I think most polling shows, and I, I have to say this to former President Trump, too, that you need to emphasize some unifying themes. Uh, but uh, President Biden answered one big question uh, during his State of the Union speech. Would he be a unifier? And the answer is no. It was very partisan, very divisive. Uh, he's got some sort of rage in her, in him, and, and, and it came out. It's, it's very sad. Uh, if you want to know the true State of the Union, uh, go to a grocery store or a gas station, and that's Biden's inflation <coughs> and reckless spending. And really, uh, Melita, he did make the most of this opportunity. He absolutely made the most of this opportunity, and he tried to tell what he called the comeback story never told of the 15 million jobs in three years, the mm -hmm. unemployment rate at a 50-year low, the middle class, um, he said, built this country and unions built the middle class. So he talked about that a little bit. And, and he did say some unifying things. He said, when Americans get knocked down, we get back up. And I thought it was wonderful that the women in Congress on the Democratic side of the aisle were wearing white in honor of Women's History Month and the suffrage movement. And President Biden reached out to those in the middle on the reproductive freedom issue, talking about a future where we restore the right to choose and protect other freedoms. Yeah, and Janelle, Republicans really criticizing the speech as being bipartisan. Uh, former President Trump uh, actually responding in real time Thursday. He did, he did, but we're, no, we're not surprised about that, right? Trump is, <laughs> Trump is always in real time. Um, but I will say this, I do think that this is the most that we, the most energy we've seen from Biden since he's been on the trail, if we can call it the trail. Um, I will say that, you know, I, there were some moments that gave me pause, though. Um, I was listening more so uh, to what he was saying and not what he was, how he was acting or what he was trying to do to, to rile people up. I don't think he can maintain that anyway. So there's some things that gave me pause, but the one thing I want to talk about is the way he continues to go after small businesses and corporations. It, to me, for people who are in the business world, people who are used and accustomed to understanding business, when they see that, they see him as someone who's incompetent, who doesn't understand how business works. When you continue to say things like, CEOs and corporations are only paying 2.8% in taxes. What you're doing is you're taking income taxes, right, from a CEO, and you're saying this income tax that the CEO is paying is 2.8%. But what you're ignoring is what these corporations are paying in taxes, right, what these small businesses are paying in taxes, like payroll taxes, state taxes, federal taxes, licensing taxes, county taxes, Social Security, Medicare, unemployment, property taxes, and the list can go on and on and on. Businesses are paying around 10 to 12% more 
in taxes, I mean more times uh, in taxes than they are the average person. So when you compare a CEO or a corporation to a school teacher, what you're really doing is highlighting that you have no clue how businesses really ran because you've only been in government. And those, those are the things that we have to, on the conservative side, we have to continue to point out. We gotta point out the bad policy because that's what's hurting people, not his emotionalism, not whatever he was juiced up on for the night. It was, <laughs> it was the fact that he's pushing bad policy. Yeah, I see Theron and Malia no, both wanting to, to jump no, in here. I'm glad that Janelle sort of emphasized that the president did achieve one major goal, and that is, is that anybody, no matter your age, no matter your party, to stand up there for that amount of time and give a State of the Union speech is tough. Uh, and, and, and only presidents have been able to do it. So he achieved the goal of basically showing that he's energetic, showing that he's passionate, and more importantly, that he's presidential. Now, this whole thing about he's not being for small businesses, Janelle, I just read a stat, and you're going to hear a lot about this when the president comes to Georgia on, on, on this week, is that he has created more jobs for small businesses, particularly Hispanic and African-American jobs and female-owned businesses yeah. than any other president. These are just no, stats. No, 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 government no, 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 no. These are, these are corporate, small business. Entrepreneurship is a big part of his platform. So this whole notion, this whole, because you've got... Okay. I'm an entrepreneur, you're an okay. entrepreneur. Right. This president has made it finish. possible for p companies like you, mine, and your husband, and other friends to operate in this country. So I think that <laughs> oh, yeah. you, the, the, the corporation thing was a very, I think, poignant call. Look, Republicans want to cut, was it, $2 trillion for the wealthy. He's saying, let's not do that. I just want the CEOs and corporations to get their fair tax and pay their fair share. They are paying their fair and share. The, and that's all he said. So it was no attack on CEOs, but he definitely wants to strengthen the middle class and give small businesses the tax No, they are deserve. paying their fair share. And I just have to say, <clears> you're right. We are small business owners. And if you talk to small business, what's the number one complaint that they have? They can't find people. So where are all these people that for all these jobs that he's creating? That's, that's number one. Number two, yeah. well, it's not apples and oranges. The fact of the matter is, no no government can create a job for a small business owner. What you, the government's supposed to do is create opportunity for us as small businesses and small business owners to be able to create opportunities for others. Let's let Malita, Malita, have Malita, <laughs> Malita have the final word. Malita, we're going to let Malita have the final word. Well, what, what he is saying is that big corporations pay their fair share, that they have to pay a minimum of 15 percent and raise, he wants to raise the corporate minimum tax. And what you have is you have a whole legion of lobbyists in Congress making sure that corporations, the big corporations, get huge tax breaks that the small businesses aren't entitled to. And you have tax policies that have favored the billionaires and the big corporations. We need some business acumen. Well, we're going to leave it there. <laughs> <We> <laughs> Both the president and the uh, former president in town here in Georgia this weekend. When we come back, we'll talk about Georgia's importance when it comes to the election campaign this year. Have a question or comment for the Georgia gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Georgia will once again be a key battleground state this election, and both the president and former president made campaign stops in Georgia Saturday ahead of the Georgia primary. Now, Melita, First Lady Jill Biden, she was just in Atlanta last week to launch the Women for Biden campaign, believes that engaging women is key to winning Georgia this go round. Well, I think she has a lot um, um, of, of truth there. And the other thing is that you, you see um, Georgia as one of the two first states the president visits after his State of the Union. So that proves that Georgia is at the top of the mind of all the presidential advisors who sent cabinet secretaries to other states, but they sent the president here right on the heels of, of her visit. And I think it's interesting that you have President, former President Trump going to Rome in the heart of Marjorie Taylor Greene district to um, where he can have a smaller crowd and you've got President um, Biden in a larger setting in a rally sponsored by several diverse organizations for his appearance. Yeah, and these dueling campaign appearances uh, come Janelle as we're seeing here in Georgia, uh, the former president actually leading in polling. Yeah, he is leading in, poll in the polls and so I'm not 
necessarily concerned so much about President Trump and Biden. Um, what I do know is that when President Trump is on the trail as of right now, and I think this is a discussion that's been talked about particularly in the Republican circles, is that he's going to have to make sure he can bring in the Nikki Haley voters. Um, that's something that's really important. Because I noticed that I saw a Fox poll that showed that 18 percent of registered voters um, are willing to support a third party candidate, but 60 percent of those voters view Biden and Trump unfavorably. And so there, and I, I think Nikki pulled around 30 or 40 percent in some states. So that, that pr little group of voters is who he's going to have to target. And I think he can do it. I know he can do it. Because with, with, with uh, Trump, his issue is not policy, it's rhetoric. So that's something that can be easily corrected. I think that he does need to reach out to Nikki Haley. I think he should kind of mend that and show that because most, most, the most important aspect of all of this is getting the, the voters to unite because it's his supporters, I think, that are causing more of the challenges than, than President Trump. So if he can get them to unite and bring in the Nikki Haley voters, I think he's, he's going to be good to go. Yeah. In the meantime, uh, Theron, on the Democratic front, uh, really the back-to-back -back appearances by First Lady Biden and President Biden here in Georgia really speaks to uh, the importance of Georgia this election. Well, we got to rebuild this Biden coalition, Deidre, and the Biden coalition is what we actually want. I want to say something that Janelle was saying. I think that Democrats should be going out to some of these Nikki Haley voters, too, uh, because a lot of them actually uh, are moderate, independent voters who didn't want Trump and they chose to participate in Republican primary. But the thing that's so encouraging to me, but this being a battleground state, I can't talk a lot about this Biden coalition. The first lady was here talking with women, women business owners. The president was back here talking to small business owners, but also bringing the Asian uh, American Pacific Islanders group, Hispanic group, and black uh, leaders as well, all endorsing him. He's building that tent that we need. Lastly, uh, they're not just coming here to just raise money either. You know, Georgia's not just an ATM for Democrats. I mean, they're putting in the work, they got people on the ground. And, I, and I'm feeling the more of the grassroots movement that's happening here. Yeah, and while there's a, a focus on uh, both Biden and Trump uh, this weekend, really there was a lot of talk still about a possible third party candidate and that possible impact on the race bill. Well, it's not going to be possible. Actually, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. has qualified to be on the presidential ballot in Georgia, and the polls show that uh, Republicans ought to be happy because he's going to be draining uh, Biden votes away from uh, uh, President Biden. But uh, the bigger picture, though, uh, with these dueling uh, rallies here in Georgia is, yes, we are a, a swing state, and that's proof of it. But um, I think what you're seeing is try to pump up the Republican vote, especially in, in the Rome area where he is. Um, surprisingly to Republicans, their vote dropped in one of the most conservative districts uh, back in 2022. So it's pumping up the vote, and you're going to see contrast. What's Trump going to say? Big surprise. The illegal immigration, uh, the massive uh, migrant crime wave that's caused by Biden's open borders policy. Polling shows that 80% uh, of the American people don't like the direction the country is going right now. Uh, Nikki Haley pledged uh, earlier to support the Republican nominee, and I think, Janelle, uh, there'll be, a, there'll be a, uh, uh, a meeting of the minds there. The biggest uh, thing that the center-right politically has in this state and around the country, according to the polls, is, is the absolute unpopularity of Joe Biden. He came into this uh, State of the Union speech as the most unpopular president of modern times. It's incredible. Melita? Well, I wanted to just address the fact that the former president almost dismissed the Haley supporters, whereas President Biden reached out to them saying that while there's a lot we won't agree on, on the fundamental issues of preserving American democracy, standing up for the rule of law, treating each other with decency and respect, preserving NATO, and standing up to America's adversaries, he, Biden, hoped he could find common ground with Haley supporters. So that's a big reach out to the middle from, from what I hear. I, th I think we also have to note that um, at the end of the day, um, the, the, the idea that someone's supposed to just jump in line because that's, this is what we have, I think we've learned over the course of the past elections that voters are just not doing that anymore. We may want them to, we may think that that's the right thing to do, but voters are not. And so if you're relying on a get in line, do what we're told uh, 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 energy to drive people to the polls, I, I'm concerned that that's not going to be in play this cycle. Well, I would just respond to the idea that the Alabama female senator who delivered the State of the Union response 
did so from her kitchen table. And I had women friends just texting me like crazy last night. Can you believe they are actually having her sit at a kitchen table to reiterate the Republican ideology that women should be barefoot pregnant at home cooking supper? Oh, please. You, you don't even believe your own propaganda line. I mean, kitchen table issues are what people want. I just said, go to the gas station, go to the grocery store and go shopping and think about all the uh, massive inflation and reckless spending that the Democrats did. Bear in mind that the Democrats had uh, several years of control and uh, the, the economy spun out of control. That's the popularity of uh, former President Trump. He wants to get back to where we had some stability. Look, the, the inflation thing, Phil's mentioned that a few times, inflation is down, all right? It's not, that's it's not, not true. It's not, it's not, not, it's not where we want it to be. Not true. Um, you can't the, feel it yet. Yeah, you can't, well, that's the thing. <laughs> you you, you got to be able to feel it. And then, right. and then the, the wages are up. Uh, people are working. Uh, unemployment is Wages down. are not up uh, for yeah. the middle class. Yes, are, yeah. that, that's I, I just think, a I think propaganda. We, yeah. All right, we've got to leave it there. Got to leave it there. Coming up, how Georgia lawmakers are figuring in in the ongoing debate over immigration. We'll have more on that on the federal and state level when we return. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Georgia really is at the forefront of uh, federal and state immigration issues now in the wake of the uh, murder of the uh, Georgia nursing student, Lakin Riley. Uh, just a real tragedy there and still feeling the impact of that here as far as immigration is concerned and efforts to push for tougher bills. We saw that at the uh, national level, the federal level, just uh, th earlier this week with the uh, passage at, in the state, state house, or the federal house mm -hmm. rather, uh, the House of Representatives, with the passage of the um, Lake and Riley Act mm -hmm. uh, that was sponsored by Representative Doug Collins. Uh, uh, Mike, Mike Collins. Mike Collins, <laughs> rather. <laughs> no, and, and uh, the whole problem in Georgia and all too many other states are sanctuary districts. And what does that mean? It means that uh, when you have your inmates in your penal facilities, uh, you need to check the citizenship status of all your inmates. That's Georgia law right now. The problem with Georgia law, and we can get to the federal law, in a minute. The problem with Georgia law is that you've got some sheriff of Gwinnett County has publicly said he's not going to check the citizenship status and work with the feds. That's outrageous. We had Athens Clark County. Uh, the sheriff there openly said, uh, no, I'm not going to check the status of these inmates. And so that's just going to help a crime wave. Now, the sheriff of Athens and Clark County, I see because of pressure from Republicans is now buckling and saying, well, gee, maybe I ought to really check their violent criminal status and work with the feds. So I think that the federal level and the state level, it's about time we said no to the influx of people. I mean, uh, and, and, and you mentioned um, Blake and Riley, the president bumbled uh, saying her name. I mean, let's say it here because it's a big issue in Georgia, and I'm glad the uh, Republicans and I hope some Democrats are going to come forward and just tighten up on the law. Yeah, on the federal level, this really was a bipartisan effort. We do want to yeah. say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, and I was glad to see that it got pushed through fairly quickly. Um, I kind of want to touch on what you mentioned on the Athens uh, Clark police situation. So I did some some digging on this. I actually have a podcast dropping um, this uh, Tuesday, the Janelle King Show, and <laughs> <laughs> shameless plug. But um, and I'm talking about this. So apparently, the the man who killed uh, Lake and Riley was arrested in Athens. I think a month prior for shoplifting, but they didn't do a status run because according to the police department they can only check status if you're arrested so they gave him a citation and let him go and so things like that I think that we are we're, we're doing great by producing some of these new policies but let's look at some common sense policies that we can do that's very simple right here in Georgia like changing that like we should be able to check status if you are in trouble for any reason it shouldn't be you know if you've gotten arrested and then secondly this gentleman was living in a um, apartment in Georgia and I don't know about you but when last time I tried to get apartments some years ago I remember having to give them back pay I had to show where I'm working you had to have a social security number and all this other stuff so why are we not creating some policies around that as well like why are we what about these these NGOs that's working with these migrants to give them housing and food and then we have people particularly low-income community people and veterans who are struggling to get these same things so there are policies that we can do that are some common sense policies that I think we can push that are that can be bipartisan as we continue on oh really um Theron Melita 
one of the real concerns here is that everyone agrees something must be done to address this issue, but that it, it this legislation, both at the state really at the state level, cast too wide a net and that there are a lot of innocent people that could be hurt by this legislation. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Melinda. Well, no, mm -hmm. that, that is true. But <clears throat> the other thing is that you have this bipartisan agreement that was hammered out in Congress that would do more to protect the border and ramp up um, policies around this issue and as a political measure to give them something to talk about on the campaign trail, Republicans are refusing to pass that package. There was a mass amnesty for illegals. You forgot to mention that part. Don't cut off. Let it, let it finish. Go ahead there. No, no, I want you to finish. Go ahead. Well, it, it's just the Republicans want their talking points without actually doing anything. <laughs> and we needed that policy um, implemented in Congress, as President Biden said during his State of the Union address. <laughs> so real quick, I think to me, Deidre, to answer your question, it's about prioritization, right? And I want to commend the Republicans for coming back to the Capitol after the horrific and sad death of Lake and Riley. I've given my condolences on the family. I know a countless amount of Democrats have expressed their condolences and their outrage with what happened. But you all have, you've seen the Democrats come back with a couple things, but the one big thing we don't know yet is, to your point, is that if you read what Terry, Nor uh, Terry Norris, the director of the Sheriff Association, basically says, is that he disagrees that a significant number of shares are willingly not reporting ICE. And he basically says that this bill that was introduced in the State House and is a good step forward, but ultimately what we don't know yet is where are law enforcement officials or how are you going to enforce these federal laws that we just talked about, but also these state laws. Because at the end of the day, you can't go around here just arresting everybody if they look or they seem suspicious. Now, Janelle just gave some interesting facts that I did not know. But it's not just illegal immigrants that are actually, um, you know, the, this Republicans refer to them. I refer to them as undocumented uh, citizens, and some are not non citizens. Well. Biden, no, but it, Biden but undocumented. calls them illegal he did call, and, and that was he said illegal. <laughs> he didn't say that. But the thing is, is that we got to Janelle's point, and to I think Phil says this too. Let's work together, local, state, and federal, to just fi fix the things that we can agree on now to make sure that bad people are down the streets and these murders occur. All right, we have to wrap it there. Coming up, our winners and losers for the week. Time now for the week's winners and losers. And Melita, we'll start with you. Well, I think um, we have to say that the governor's plan for bringing um, a $5 billion Rivian plant to um, middle Georgia, Walton and Morgan counties is a loser this week because Rivian has put that plan on hold. And meanwhile, the residents of that county, those counties, are have a 2,000 acre mud lake in their midst because the ground has already been cleared and you just have mud that's impacting the people who um, depend on private wells. So that's a big lose-lose. My winner for the week would be the fact that we have so many candidates on both sides of the aisle who filed to run for office this, this November and, and some of them won't be winners in November, but we all win when there are contested races and a robust discussion of policy issues. All right, Phil? Well, I got a winner and it's a shout out to the Conservative Policy Leadership Institute in Atlanta. They have classes where they train people in policy issues ranging from uh, fiscal responsibility. Now, I would admit both parties could use a dose of fiscal responsibility and also um, free enterprise uh, economics and not socialism. And then I have a friend over in Columbia County. He's the district attorney over there, Bobby Christine. He's a major general in the Army National Guard. He's in the JAG Corps. He was promoted to major <coughs> general. It's the first time they've had a major general general there since 1776. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> All right. You know, I don't there. usually do losers, but I definitely got to make Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene a loser uh, for basically shouting and disrespecting uh, the president doing his State of the Union address. But on a more positive note, I do want to commend Republicans and Democrats and everyone who was there because there was a standing ovation when the president talked about the legacy of Congressman John Lewis and encouraged Congress to pass the John Lewis Voting uh, Act, which has it, been introduced and hasn't been passed yet. And also, I want to give a special shout out to all the women. Today is International Women Day. So, Deidre, Janelle and Melita and all the women out there definitely want to congratulate you all and also celebrating Women History Month and I want to make Melita a winner her organization Georgia Win List they were at the Capitol this week where they had six new candidates and all the other endorsed women as well who came out in a massive press conference and it was just really good to see these women uh, running for office and definitely Melita definitely commend you for your great work. Well deserved. <laughs> Janelle? Okay so did you know that afternoon tea 
um, in English tea gardens was the first location where women could socialize with men without being seen as scandalous. So I had to start with that fun fact because I would like to announce that my good friend Janet Prelo has launched her tea line. Um, it's called the Grace Graceful Tea Company, and she has a, a tea called K Bourbon that I think is for Kelvin, and it's um, <laughs> and it actually has a smoked bourbon taste to it, so it's really really good. So go to GratefulTeaCompany.com and check her out. And then lastly, please, I encourage you to attend the PRC Medical Banquet, a pro life center, on March 14th at the Chapel Hill Church um, at 6:15. You have to register. You can go to PartnersForPRC.com to attend, and it's free to attend. All right. Well, thank you all, great winners and losers there. Thanks for joining us. You all have a great week. The opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the panelists appearing in this program.